Hi, I'm Dane. Welcome back to Professor in Progress. This will be the last of my PhD backstory videos uh, since my departure for fieldwork in January is fast approaching. In this episode, I want to talk about what I did between honours and my PhD. Now, just completing honours, particularly with good grades as I had, is sufficient to go on to a PhD straight away, and certainly a lot of people do that. Uh, personally, though, I felt I wasn't ready yet, and I took another three years before I came to where I am now. I did different things across different places in those three years, uh, but if I had to pick a unifying theme, it would probably be language acquisition and anxiety about language acquisition. So a quick rundown of what each year involved before I continue. In 2013, I moved to Thailand to teach English, learn Thai, and scope out potential field sites for my PhD. In 2014, I was back in Australia and living in Melbourne, where I had employment at Deakin University, uh, their Burwood campus, where I was a tutor and marker in the first year anthropology classes there on a casual basis. In 2015, I moved to Canberra where I began and completed a Master of Asia Pacific study. So the main reason I went to Thailand in 2013 was because I knew I would be doing a, a PhD eventually that was in Thailand and I didn't know any Thai myself. Um, so to remedy that, I figured complete immersion would be the best approach to complement the online language course I was running through by myself. Linked in the description if you would like to learn Thai for free. I also wanted to have a bit of a trial run of living in fieldwork-like conditions um, to make sure I was up for coping with anthropological research. I taught myself to read and write in the weeks leading up to my departure. I took a TEFL course in Chiang Mai for the first month I was there. Then I spent another couple of months in the city doing odd jobs. Um, and then I made my way to the village where I volunteered as an English teacher for six months. And that's the same village that is going to be my field site next year. The question I get asked the most about this trip is how did I find the village? Um, and I'm sure that's a question a lot of anthropologists get about their field sites as well. Now, for me, this was part of the service that UniTEFL, the place I did my teaching English course, um, they provided that service as part of their hooking us up to jobs at the end. Now, normally they would line up job interviews with us at schools around Chiang Mai or in Bangkok. This was an unusual request, but they got in touch with a couple who are based in Mae Sarian and run tourist trips to various Thailand villages in the area, um, so they got me in touch with them and then those people drove me to the village and got me in touch with the staff at the school there and that's where I ended up staying. Originally I had planned to learn score Korean as well as Thai, but I quickly found that learning two new languages simultaneously was a bit difficult for me to really manage properly. So, given the predominance of Thai at the school environment where I spent most of my time while I was there, uh, I just focused my efforts on Thai that time during this trip. As the end of the year approached, I still didn't really feel confident enough in my Thai to be doing ethnographic research there though. Back when anthropology was a tad more colonial and we were going in to document the customs and languages of never before studied peoples, we didn't really have a choice because nobody had ever encountered these languages before, so learning language in the field was kind of the norm. That's not really the case anymore. It's kind of expected, and rightly so, that we should actually have some grounding in the language before we go there. Anthropologists back then also typically had a lot longer in the field than we have time for these days. Um, and the general consensus these days is that a lot of the anthropologists back then kind of overstated their linguistic expertise. I'm hoping to squeeze in about a year and a half of field work if I can, um, and I am going to be learning Karen in the field mainly. So it was important to me that I know as much Thai as possible before going in so that you know, I'm not trying to juggle learning both from scratch in the field. In order to refine what Thai I had at the end of 2013, I decided I wanted to take on a master's degree so I could study Thai formally in a classroom. I did decide though that I wanted a break before going straight back into study. 2014 was kind of a second gap year for me. I didn't really have a mission. I continued studying Thai as best I could on my own. 
Uh, and Tanya got me some work at Deakin, uh, first as a research assistant and then as a sessional tutor. This was a fantastic opportunity that I hadn't planned for at all and is really what made my year off invaluable to my professional development. Besides that though, I just did a lot with friends and put a lot of effort into Pokemon video game tournaments, which paid off and culminated in this. Well, congratulations, you are going on to represent Australia at the 2014 Pokemon Video Game World Championships. How excited are you? Very, very excited. What does it mean to get to this level of championship it's to you? Extraordinary, like, I'm representing our country in an international thing, like, that's amazing. And this. The 2014 Pokemon World Championships is about to begin! And I made the quarterfinals in Washington and came away with a whole bunch of merchandise to go with my free trip to the US. So 2015 was a far more structured year. I came to the ANU for one reason above all else. It's literally the only university in Australia where you can study Thai. The reason I chose a Master of Asia Pacific study specifically, on the one hand is obviously because it involved a language component. The other big thing it offered me though was a chance to patch up the weaknesses in my honours thesis that I discussed last time. This was a master's by coursework, so in addition to studying Thai, I also took classes from a number of disciplines uh, on things more general to the Asian Pacific region. So basically all the stuff that I didn't learn in my undergrad at Deakin that was more discipline focused. I took classes drawing on linguistics, history, international relations, political science, sociology, and anthropology. My favorite class that I took in that course though, and the most unique to ANU, was called Southeast Asian Frontiers. This was an intensive four week in-country course that took us along the Thai Burma border with my Thai teacher leading the way and we were interviewing teachers, doctors, kids, police, government officials, refugees, so much more. Click up there to go watch a short video ANU made during my year's trip. The final benefit of doing my masters though was to get to know ANU's academic community before starting my PhD. I met my supervisors before applying and work with them and other experts on the region to develop my application and just plan generally for the years ahead. And that brings me to this year, which you've already heard a bit about in my other videos. Now again, language proficiency was the main barrier I saw going straight from the honours to the PhD. Um, so with my fieldwork commencing about a month from now, am I there yet? Yes and no, which is kind of the answer academics like to always give about every question. My tie is leaps and bounds ahead of where it was when I returned to Australia at the end of 2013. But I'm nowhere near comfortable saying that I'm fluent. But I am confident that I can ask people to describe their relationships, their activities, their tools, and that I'll be able to understand those answers in real time and engage in conversations about them. Discussions about cosmology and identity, also important for anthropologists to cover and pretty central to my research questions, may not be as productive in the earlier months of my fieldwork unless I rely on interpreters, which I don't really want to do if I can avoid it. But hopefully I'll have enough Thai or Karen to get at some of the deeper aspects of people's lives and values just in the course of daily conversation by the end of my fieldwork. At the end of the day, I don't know how sufficient my language ability is or will become. Um, and the nature of the thesis I eventually write will change accordingly. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't quite anxious about this aspect of my research more than any other. Um, I've come a long way, but I still don't feel I'm at where I want it to be or where I feel I should be. As I said earlier though, I think a lot of this anxiety is derived from the fact that a lot of older anthropologists tended to overstate their linguistic and cultural competencies in their field. Contemporary anthropologists, by comparison, are much more transparent and reflexive about these compromises we make, um, and the Academy is better for it because those compromises were always there. Now, the next one of these I upload will probably be just before I head off to Thailand, actually. Um, so, in the meantime, please subscribe, leave your thoughts in the comments, and I'll see you then.